scorn, 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 scorn. So that was the Six Nations 2024. Isla might have taken the trophy around to Mrs. Ringrose's house once again, but it feels like the team of the tournament, the one we're talking about for most of us, was Italy. Promise turning into two wins and a draw. And before we dig deep into how Gonzalo Quesada has revolutionised his team and their win over Wales, I decided, admittedly before Super Saturday, so apologies for the handful of details and comments that might be slightly aged by the victory in Cardiff, to let channel co-person and my brother Will loose with a microphone and notepad and a replay of their first win of 2024. For what a thing to say against Scotland. When Paolo Gobisi collapsed in that pool of his own tears as his conversion beat Wales in 2022, you could see history on his face. A generation who were once young Italia fans in school every Monday discussing how good Sergio was once again, and five times a year how they dreamt of one day winning a game in rugby's greatest championship. Fast forward two years and Paolo is drowning not in tears, but more the remains of his melted kicking tee. Head in hands, an overperformer, but not quite a winner. A draw against a French team who beat them by 60 six months earlier is a result most of these players would never have dreamt of. Partly because nobody goes to bed thinking about hitting the post and drawing with anybody, but as Mofana goes into touch here, Captain Lamoro says it all. This simply isn't enough for us. Well, men's rugby's most likable captain got his moment to celebrate properly just one match later, as Italy secured their first championship home win in 11 years. Finally, it was Arancini over Aberdeen, Colosseums over Kilts, Da Vinci over De Rolo, Paolo Garbisi over Paolo Nutini, a statement first win against Casada's name. Forget one win in a career, this Italian side find themselves staring at a possible top half finish as they go into Super Saturday. So, how did Gonzalo get one over Gregor? What's with this new Azuri attack? And just where does this leave Scotland as they prepare to halt the Irish invasion? I think we've all been guilty of saying Italy are improving year on year merely through surprise at them playing well, but this time the difference in Italian psyche was clear. It was tangible. In the Brex fueled haze at full time, it's so easy to forget just how Saturday started and how Scotland put themselves in point a minute control of the game. Scotland's first try, scored by Xander Ferguson, comes from an unstructured scenario, a sequence of offloads that allows Scotland to play at pace and eventually using their pack to drive over against a fairly passive Italian defence. Their second second effort, finished by Carl Stain, is frankly an attacking masterclass by Tooney's troops. Scotland take a quick throw, carry up the wing, and Russell cause a shape to the players outside him. The Italian defence condense, expecting a hard carry from one of these two, but instead, Cam Redpath makes a small adjustment late on to accommodate what Finn's just called for. Russell goes for the classic dummy switch pop, undefendable move, and Redpath finds himself tussling with two backs, Brex and Garbisi, and he manages to get the offload into Fagerson. Garbisi then isn't quite sure where to defend, so just joins in on the blind side, meaning when Brex gets back to his feet, him and Ioani are the only backs covering this whole side of the pitch. Kinghorn gives it to Duan because why wouldn't you? George Horn gets a wee block in, Dewey makes the break and is scragged by Menoncello. Scotland go for another phase, then Russell calls for a ball in the boot. Nothing opens up, so he just goes himself, incidentally taking Brex out the game again. Italy, having worked from one side to the other, are slow to fold. So instead of trusting someone to just get round and cover the guard position, Pajarello just goes back and fills it in himself, meaning Vincent runs around him in order to cover the space outside him. King Blair Horn spies the mismatch, positions himself on Vincent's outside shoulder, starts really flat and just targets Ioani in front of him. Monty momentarily moves inwards, allowing Stain to hit a great line outside him and out-muscle Capuazzo to score. And yet, the conversion of this try proved the end of Scotland's period of ascendancy. Sure, they scored one more try after this, but then Scotland suffered a 50-minute drought in point scoring. Casada installing a calm and composure in this Italian team who, in years gone by, would have wilted. Rugby's answer to James Bond gambled. With Scotland and crossing the gain line so easily, Italy shifted in a matter of minutes to a much riskier all-in blitz defence. Much like his boss at Domino's when he bunked off work to play rugby for Italy, good one Ross, they put a remarkable amount of trust in Vincent here. In theory, you'd think his man is Fagerson, but he figures the ball's likely going to rustle out the back again, and with no blockers in front of him, he ditches the defensive line to fly in Finn's face. It's risky, but he figures the team can probably cover if a tired prop makes a break on his outside. It's a proper winger's read by a number eight. It's brilliant. Finn then taps it on, misses his man, the ball bobbles around, and Brex breaks Darge. The defence is suddenly on top, and Russell has little choice but to just kick it back to where they started. They drop the ball, Italy gets it to Brex, who whacks it in behind, Scotland having lost a load of terror. Which brings me on to something, right? Michele Lamoureux broke the all-time record for the most tackles by an Italian in the Six Nations game on Saturday, right? Making 27 tackles on his own. And he wasn't the only one to play that well. Menoncello was monstrous, Negri was nasty, and yet, above all, the true MVP of the day, other than whoever taught Garbisi how to put the ball on a tee properly, was that man. The spiciest centre in the Six Nations, Nacho 
Brex. The best way to describe Brex's contribution to his 34 caps for Italy so far is that he's always involved. He's not afraid to make decisions that could so easily backfire, but look brilliant if they do come off. But this, this game, this felt like Brex's crowning moment in a blue jersey. So few players have deserved a Man of the Match award like he did this weekend. This turnover is titanic, a possible game-saving moment that removed any hint of Scottish momentum. And speaking of risky defensive reads, here, Brex defends really high in the line, forcing Jones to just leave the pass and let it drift onto Stain. The ball dips on Stain at the last moment, he fails to recover it, Liner picks it up and comes very close to scoring, if not for Duan just instead picking up Capuozzo and taking him out like a bin bag. But Brex's biggest moment signalled the end of Italy's opening lull, as it was him who touched down to put Lamoureux's lads back in the contest. Italy here play a 7 plus 1 man lineout. They have 7 men in the actual line, plus Lamoureux here as the insert, ready to push when they form a maul. They drag left winger, Monte Ioani, to the front of the line, and Scotland go, great, we can essentially just legally bring a back offside by starting them in the lineout, so they match them. They put Carl Stain at the front of the lineout, as you would. Italy form a maul, not splitting off straight away, but not especially pushing. Ioani then breaks away, and George Horn just spends the whole time watching him, knowing he's probably about to do something tricky, try and break off somewhere. Just before the maul moves far enough for Angus Garden to call the lineout over, Nicotera peels off and feeds Pajrello, stood at 10. Liner and Capuozzo have both held the width brilliantly, and Garbisi really sells this line in the boot, maintaining the interest of both Kinghorn and Van der Merwe out wide. With right wing and scrum half on one edge and left wing and fullback on the other, there's no one covering the backfield. So right as the defence advances, Pajarello puts a gorgeous dink in behind. It's perfectly placed so Brex just needs to run a straight line, make a superb pickup and dot down. One of the biggest changes in Italy is their sheer efficiency, rarely wasting bodies, constantly looking to keep men on their feet and use their resources really smartly, similarly to the Irish attack that's been so dominant recently. And this style of attack led to this try scored by the man whose name sounds most like a Munster player from the mid noughties Stephen Varney. As soon as Italy get a dominant carry, they opt for a one-man ruck, only sending Rootser in here to clear out, allowing everyone else to join the attack and stretch the Scottish line. With the extra man on their feet, Italy bring in a pod of four, and suddenly the defence have a really tough time telling which option they'll actually take. Three out of these four players are realistic options, and they can all pass to each other, or indeed to Garbisi in the boot, meaning once it does go out the back, Schumann has turned his shoulders inwards, so Paolo can bring Ceccarelli onto the ball, and he can thunder into Shuey. Something we've seen Ireland, the best attacking team in the world, start to do over the last three years is adapt on the fly. Wingers can come in and start calling shapes themselves, forwards can act as outside backs, and just as importantly, it wasn't uncommon to see Johnny Sexton hitting rucks himself to speed up the attack and allow somebody else to temporarily run the green machine. And Italy are taking all the right pages from Faz's gang. Garbisi knows there's an overlap, but it's entirely dependent on quick ball. There's no time to wait for somebody else to arrive, so he absolutely belts Darge out of the ruck here. It's brilliant. Trusting his pack to morph a new phase shape on the fly. At surface level, this looks like a regular pod of three, but with Liner running as a kind of auxiliary forward, running a sort of short line here. It's not unusual, he's done this sort of thing for Quinns before. However, Canone spots red path shooting out of line, so calls the play off, looping around and acting as an extra attacker. Liner, instead of running the hard line, holds his feet, looks up, sees Stain moving in and ships the ball to the meat feast number eight, Ross Vinson. His delivery to the 22 is lightning quick and they continue to go wide. Capuozzo goes for a gap and once again, Italy win this ruck with only one player over the breakdown. Scotland are overwhelmed with players to mark. Any of these three could get the ball. Ioani and Brex could also easily join up with the forwards or the ball could go wide at any moment. And when it does, Italy's sheer numbers off the ball open the gap for Varney to go himself and score. Scotland had a real hard time defending an attack with this many genuine threats. The fact that Azuri now have eight ballers in the pack and a centre whose literal middle name is Gainline, it's extremely difficult to slow their attack down. Once all momentum swung to the home side, Scotland just kept compounding errors on errors. Finn flinging loose balls like this, Duan dancing on the wrong side of the touchline, and pointless penalties mounting against them. On one hand, it's now even clearer how important the Tartan Tongan Sioni Tuopolotu is to the Scottish attack, a man whose genuine triple threat often offers Townsend team a plan B when the defence starts to get on top. But also, it's not like Cam Redpath played badly at all. The final try of the game showing Finn's bath buddy is more than capable of running the same shape they often run with Tuopolotu, although the Hugh Path triangle doesn't quite have the same ring to it. Jones and Russell's convincing running lines allowing Redpath to make a half break, getting them on the front foot, and eventually leading to a very nearly crucial try. Scotland did show signs that they know how to halt this attack. Christie, Dempsey, and Fagerson all read this two-phase move, which, funnily enough, they'd ran against England a few weeks earlier, watching Garbisi the whole time. They stop Negri dead on the gain line, which is easier said than done, but leaving Ioani 
finding no room to pick and go, allowing Ferguson to get over and win the turnover. Or here, once again, Garbisi flashes from right to left, and Scotland spot this early. Cummings comes in and counter rucks, spoiling the ball for Pajarello, who struggles to pick it up, has to run backwards, spin around, and chucks the ball to Christie, who's read the play from miles out and intercepts. He knows it's worth the risk to offload on turnover ball, so the Scots shift the ball to their standoff, Finn Russell, who naturally nails a 50-22, which of course sets up the line out, which leads to this score for Schumann. But the difference between Sergio's side, the Garbisi's discussed in the back garden, and the Azuri of today is Italy don't merely have one star player. However, whilst their most recognisable player, Ange Capuozzo, was fantastic on Saturday, they do have a new star rising in the extremely qualified form of Lewis Liner. Liner's international introduction was reminiscent of maybe James Lowe or Will Jordan when they first took to the test circuit. He has the energy of someone who's been playing at this level for ages, immediately looking right at home, taking no time to acclimatise to the tempo of test rugby, and kicking off his 100% win streak in Italian colours. Sometimes it can take wingers a few touches to get going at the top tier, but mate, this is Lewis Liner's first touch of test rugby. Brex gets that incredible turnover that we were on about earlier, right? And Liner runs in, takes the quick tap, and boots the ball downfield into space where only an isolated hooker, George Turner, is back there. So Turner doesn't fancy kicking it back himself, so he just runs in field, knowing that's probably where the most of his support will be. But it's also where the majority of the Italian jackal frets are. Vincent stuffs Turner's crusts, and Nicotera nips straight to his feet, gets his hands on the ball, forcing Horn to go straight off his feet, and the next thing you know, Pajarello kicks three points. Italy's double O boss has built up an insistence that the Azuri will die another day. It's only taken one half-decent result for Italy to build up a real sense of resilience in how they play. Even in the last seconds of the game, they stuck to their high danger defensive plan, letting Capuazzo fly in to make risky reads so Scotland sends speculative seeds, eventually resulting in a knock-on and the full time whistle. On Saturday, we watched a generation of players who used to spend their weekends idolising Sergio Peruse, a man who only won nine Six Nations games in his career, go the extra mile. This crop are only beginning their journey, and are already looking at leapfrogging the notion that wins are just some novelty one-off, because this is a group who achieve historic results. And despite the celebrations, we'll always have a little bit of them saying that this simply isn't enough for us. On Saturday, there was no need for Paolo Garbisi to drown in his tears of joy, because this weekend coming, they head to the spot still stained by his tears, knowing this is their chance to make winning a habit. Merry Christmas. Thank you for watching that. I hope you enjoyed that. It was recorded and made and written and sort of everything before Super Saturday. And then we ran out of time to get things up and get things together. And we had a nightmare last week. This was a rugby ball. And we made quite a few videos last week and just figured, you know what? We can't pull them all up in the same minute, can we? It would be silly. Be deeply, deeply silly. Um, so there is some stuff as well. We're going to do a big deeper dive into Italy, into their four Six Nations, into how that went, what they did, how Quasada has turned this team around or kind of allow this team to kick on, perhaps. Uh, we're going to look into that. So there's some on. stuff that will be um, done in the, that video coming up. We've got some more stuff as well. Don't Ireland v Scotland it. will be coming in the next few days. That's the next one. Um, so that's well underway. The Grand Slam not decided not to be the title decider. Um, and then we've got a bonus fun thing with a group of rugby people that will hopefully be coming up next week or being well. Um, and more stuff. There's always stuff going on. It's very exciting. It's an exciting time. To I think so. Be a rugby person. Four. Uh, yeah. Ah, oh, two. Rugby. rugby. We're going to run away with this game early on. What a result.